It is Tuesday, the 16th of July. Welcome to our morning devotion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise. And with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Many upright Lutherans have an aversion to private confession and absolution. This is because, first of all, they regard its institution partly as something new and partly as a return to papal institutions. But this is not true. Private confession was in use long before the rise of the papacy, and until the 18th century, it existed in all Lutheran congregations in all countries. Only a few enthusiasts openly rejected it, and only after the rationalists, that is, the preachers of reason of the new age, had increased in the Lutheran churches, only then was private confession abolished and the general confession introduced in its place. A second reason why so many inveigh against private confession derives from the belief that the Christian church does not have the power to forgive sins on earth. These individuals have become just like the Pharisees, who after hearing of one who forgives sin, thought, this man is blaspheming, for who can forgive sins but God alone? Either such people do not believe in God's word, or they do not consider that forgiving sins in their own name and in the name of God are two different things. In his own name, of course, only Christ could speak the absolution, for only to him did God say, sit at my right hand. But in God's and Christ's name, the servants of the church are loose, and excuse me, the servants of the church also loose and bind, for Christ himself has commanded them to do so. Therefore, St. Paul offers the words of today's text, what further proof does one need? A third reason why so many fail to recognize the special comfort that lies in private absolution is that they do not vividly recognize their sins. They may say, I have no need of this. I can sufficiently comfort myself with the general absolution. However, it is not possible that a true Christian would not at times be so weighed down by his sins that from his heart he would gladly hear the voice, your sins are forgiven you. Or are there today Christians with the kind of strong faith that people sought in vain at the time of the Reformation? Indeed, is there anything more lacking today than strong faith? Everyone who wants to be sufficiently comforted should examine himself closely to see if this contentment has arisen from the strength of his faith, or if it has resulted from his own disregard for his sins. It is no wonder that thoughtless Christians do not desire private absolution. The wounds of their sins do not burn them, and thus they do not desire the soothing balm. A fourth reason why so many do not want to use private confession is because it was not generally introduced into the contemporary church. Instead, private absolution was granted mostly to gross sinners who returned penitent. Therefore, one may say, is not every Christian free to use or not to use the human institution of seeking private absolution before every use of the Lord's Supper? This is truly a part of Christian freedom. Therefore, no Christian should and can be compelled 
but we might well ask ourselves if that which a person can do is also godly. A fifth and final reason why so many oppose the use of private absolution is because they suppose that it must be preceded by a detailed confession of their sins. How, they say, should I uncover to a man the secrets of my heart in whose experience or honesty I perhaps have no confidence at all? Must I not fear that a dishonest father confessor would misuse my confession? There is no demand that the special absolution be preceded by a special confession of sin. Does not Christ absolve the paralytic without such a confession? Was it not enough for him that the paralytic came to him as a poor sinner with a believing heart? In the same way, an enumeration of sins is never demanded by a right-believing servant of Christ. Indeed, it is forbidden, as the words of the 25th article of the Augsburg Confession make clear, and it is taught about confession that one should not compel anyone to specify the sins. And so we pray. All praise, eternal Son, to thee, for absolution full and free, in which thou showest forth thy grace, from false indulgence guard our race. Amen. And we pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we join together in prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.